In the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the last few weeks, we have been exploring the magnificent chapter in Romans that speaks of the work of the Spirit and Christian hope and suffering. Romans 8. And I would say, if you have a Bible near you, go ahead and open your Bible to Romans chapter 8, because I'm going to, to be reading from the entire chapter, um, not just our reading, so we can explore it together. Last week, we talked about Christian hope and what exactly we are promised, that we are promised way more than heaven when we die. In the fullness of time, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that our bodies, like Jesus' body, is, are resurrected. And then Romans 8 says that all of creation will be renewed. And Revelation and Ephesians 1 say that heaven and earth will be united. Nothing is destroyed but united, and everything is brought under Christ's gracious rule. And our eternal life, our work here, is the beginning of our eternal life and is a life of hope, even when we suffer. Because our suffering as Christians is not in vain. When we suffer, when we sacrifice in love for the glory of God and the welfare of the world. And Romans 8 is a treatise on the work of the Spirit. The ministries of the Spirit are very clear in this chapter. When the Spirit works in our lives, first we are given new life. We're forgiven. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Now there, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. So we are forgiven, but we're way more than forgiven. We are adopted children of God. Verses 14 and 15 of Romans 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So that can bring us courage. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing with witness that with our spirit that we are children of God. So new life, forgiveness, and then adoption. And then today, in this wonderful, reassuring passage from Romans that you have in your bulletin, we hear that the ministry of this spirit is assurance, blessed assurance. And at this time in our lives and the history of the world, that kind of assurance of God's love is so needed. So let's explore what God is doing in the Holy Spirit with assurance in our lives. First, we hear that God prays for us. Then we hear that God has planned for us, and if we allow the Spirit to work in our lives and pray for us, to intercede for us, we become workers in participants in his plan, and as we do serve him, we are given an abiding sense of God's love. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, nothing, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know about you, but right now I want to know in a deep way to have that love of God take root in my life in a deeper way. So let's explore the work of the Spirit, as the Spirit gives us blessed assurance. So the Spirit prays for us. Verse 26 of chapter 8 of Romans. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints 
according to the will of God. Two things about the prayer of the Spirit in our lives. The first thing is humility. The foundation of prayer is humility. The moment we say, God, I don't have the words. I don't have the words to pray to you that will help me communicate how I'm feeling right now in the midst of separation or confusion. And I don't have the words to say to those who are hurting. That's humility, and that's the moment we begin to trust that the Spirit will pray for us in our weakness and pray through us. So when we are called into prayer, which is the first vocation of Christians, and we need to be reminded of that during times of distress in the world, the most effective thing we can do is come before God, even when we don't know how to pray, and open our hearts in humility to God, knowing that the promises are true, that, that the moment we say we don't know and we have no words, the Spirit begins to pray for us. And then we have, we have humility, and then we have discernment. And God, who searches the heart, knows what the mind of the Spirit, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit prays when we can't and prays for those we want to pray for in words too deep to, to understand. But also, the Spirit intercedes for us and granting us discernment and wisdom about how to pray. We begin to have the words because the Spirit works more and more in our lives. In John 14, Jesus says to his disciples, I'm not going to leave you alone, but I will send an advocate, the Holy Spirit, who will do two things, teach you and remind you of all that I have said. So when we allow the Spirit to work in our lives and we go before the Spirit and say, pray for me, pray through me, and teach me how to pray, then we begin to be t taught and reminded of all Jesus has said, and those prayers begin to work in our lives in a very tangible way. In Luke 11, the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gives them the Lord's Prayer. As we allow the Spirit to pray through us and in us and for us, we begin to live the Lord's Prayer, which is a prayer for the Christian life. And when we say, Thy kingdom come, we realize that God is working right now in an inbreaking of that future event of the fullness of time, that every, every act we do for his glory is an inbreaking of the kingdom, and we get to participate in his kingdom come. Also, we learn perseverance in prayer, and we, we learn to pray for the Holy Spirit. Read all of Chapter 11 in Jesus' teaching of prayer, he teaches about perseverance, and he teaches about praying for the Holy Spirit to, to take root in a deeper way in our lives. And finally, we start to say those prayers that Jesus commands us to pray. When we're hurt, when we're offended, we pray for our enemies, and we serve them. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, teaching us and reminding us and giving us discernment so that we might participate in the plan God has already set for us. We hear today in verse 28 that we know all things, say Paul, all things work together for good for those who love God. All things. And then we have all these verse, verses about predestination and justification. We could spend a lot of time on those theological concepts, but what we need to know is God has a plan for us, but God gives us freedom. When we talk about God's plan for us, we need to remember that we need to hold two things up. One, that God is utterly committed to our welfare. He's got plans for us with hope. But God is also utterly committed to our freedom. He still gives us free will. And, and if we approach God knowing that, we can offer everything that happens to us in this fallen world for good. All things will work for good for those who love God. When you love God, you offer God everything that happens to you. The good and the bad. The joy and the suffering. Trusting that God can bring good out of them. And not only all our experiences, but here's the challenge. 
we're to offer God our very lives and everything we've ever done. And I know that I've made some great choices and I've made some not so great choices. And I think our temptation is when we serve God to say, you can have the best of me. You can have my best gifts. I want to be joyful for you. But these other things that I've done, I really don't think you probably could use. That's not what God is calling us to do. We're being summoned to offer God everything that we've ever done so that God can use it to his glory. And I know that some of us might think that that can't happen. But remember Genesis 50, Joseph has been approached by his repentant brothers after they have done all those things, pushed him into the pit, left him, sold him to, into slavery. And finally they're coming to him for help and they're repentant and they're afraid. And do you remember what Joseph said? Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So everything that we have done, the good and the bad when it is offered to God, can end up blessing others. And God, when we offer all of our choices and all of the things we've done to God, will not only use everything, but begin to transform those shortcomings we have. And suddenly, as we minister and we serve God, they begin to dissipate. And the soul, our souls, are gracefully elevated. So when we let God pray through us and for us, and when we realize that he has had us planned for his plan all along, then we begin to participate in a way that allows us to experience the love of God. Paul says... No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. This is a man who experienced, in verse 20, 35, we hear uh, hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, all those things. Read Acts. It's a page turner. Paul has all those things happen to him as he serves God, but has this unflappable peace that begins to animate his life. And really, at this point in the history of the world, we need people of peace, people who are convicted of God's unwavering love for them. God loves you. There is nothing you have done or nothing you can do to change that. But to experience God's love, you have to be humble. Ask for discernment. Participate in his plan. Offer everything you do, everything you are, everything that has happened to you to God. There is nothing, not a pandemic, not a virus, not separation from one another, not stressful situations in our homes, not worry about what will happen in the future with our children and their schools. All these things are real struggles, challenges, suffering. But remember, the abiding love of God becomes real to you to the degree that you share it. We are to be people of peace, but also when people experience hardship, distress, persecution, any kind of suffering, the minute we turn away from our own anxiety and fear and begin to reach out in love to others, that's the beginning of holy fellowship and God's love animating our relationships. And then we begin to be people of peace, convicted like Paul of God's love for us. We need to hear this today, that, that no matter where we are right now, whatever you're struggling with, wherever you are, whatever your biggest obstacle is, the Spirit knows what it is. The Spirit searches your heart. The Spirit will pray for you and intercede for you, give you discernment. Allow you to know the power of God's work in your life that everything that you offer God will be used to God's glory. And as we do that, as you do that, as you realize the work of the Spirit in your life, you will be convicted like Paul and so many Christians throughout the ages 
that God loves you and will not spare any good from you so that you might glorify him in all that you do. Amen.